All right, this is Mike Railing again, and today I'm going to interview my friend Terry French, who has agreed to uh, to this strenuous interview. And as you can see, she's in a uh, outside of a coffee shop in Huntsville because they're still <laughs> RVing, and uh, internet being what it is in RV land, uh, this this was the best place. But so she's got her head in the clouds, which is just fine with me usually do and uh, uh, if you don't know Terry has done everything uh, in in haiku at one point or another she's published several collections of her poetry she has uh, served on the board of the haiku foundation one of my favorite places she has been the southeast coordinator for the haiku society of America uh, and she has been and the past editor of Prune Juice, uh, uh, the sister Senru journal out there that, that majors in the same area as Failed Haiku. And she actually guest edited at uh, Failed Haiku once. So uh, she's done a lot, and uh, we'll let her talk about it. But Terry, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background and where you come from and, and where you're at? Already, uh, where I'm at right now is outside of a, a Mexican uh, and a telephone repair place, but <laughs> in Huntsville, uh, we're parked up in Montesano State Park in Huntsville, Alabama, and there's not very good reception. But anyway, originally I'm from Michigan, your neck of the woods, uh, near not too far from Detroit. Moved to Alabama in 1987 and two and a half years ago i raised my family here and then two and a half years ago my husband and i sold everything and bought an rv and took to the roads and three months later covid hit <laughs> and that was fun so we've decided we we want to settle back down and and lo and behold back in huntsville uh bought some land and now we're looking for a builder which is proving to be a bit of a chick so that's where I'm at right now. Well, good. I mean, you know, and it was fun. Uh, your your posts on uh, uh, Facebook and other places about your you and Raymond's tours uh, through America in the in the RV were cool. And of course, we got. Do we don't want to forget? Uh, Raymond is your husband, who's also a good guy and a bit of a poet and an aeronautical engineer. And Chaka, who is your dog, who is fantastic. But uh, let me uh, just ask a couple of quick questions. Like, where can people find your work on the Internet? I, I know that you have some sites. Uh, I have a, a web page, Terry L. French. Um, I think it's Terry L. French. I don't know. We'll put a link. <laughs> and, and I have some... Uh, a couple of books on Amazon if you search. I always use my middle initial, so it's Terry L. French. Oh, we can find, we, we're going to put links to all of these down below, so anybody who's interested can can click on them and go find your work. Okay. Where else? Uh, you, are, you're on the Haiku Foundation too, right? Yeah, on the Haiku Foundation and probably Haiku Society, and there's a few things on YouTube and I have a, a writer's page on Facebook, and then I have a personal page on Facebook. My writer's page uses the middle initial, Terry L. French. Cool. So. Well, we're going to put all the links below so people can find you and, and, and find your work. But I'm curious more than anything else, because I'm not sure. I think we probably discussed it at some point. But how did you fall into Haiku and Senru? How did the, how did, what what was it the trigger and how did you how did you land in our world here well you know like most people i learned the traditional 575 way back a million years ago and um i've always been a writer and i've always written poetry not always good poetry but poetry i actually went into journalism in school and then I did some freelance writing off and on. And for some reason, I got interested in haiku again. I think I saw an article online that Michael Dylan Welch had written or something. And then I contacted him and I sent him a few haiku and he was very kind. 
and did not say, oh my God, what is this? <laughs> and uh, we went back and forth and he sent me some links and I just kind of um, took it from there. Now, as far as Senru goes, uh, my mind just kind of works that way. Kind of witty, sarcastic, uh, seeing the absurd in life and whatnot. So I kind of uh, bend that way. <laughs> well, and, and the last few years, the absurd has been pretty prevalent. So we've oh, yeah. we've had an awful lot of it here <laughs> lately, and it continues. By the way, it's like uh, it's an unfolding uh, drama here. But uh, no, I think that uh, most people have that experience. And uh, I will say, we'll also put a link to uh, MDW's uh, Michael Dylan Walsh's Grace Guts because that yeah, is I love Grace Guts. La, there, there's so much there that uh, I'm not sure I've, I claim to have tried to read it all. I'm not sure I actually made it. But uh, Michael has a wealth of information, particularly for newbies. And that was one of the places that a lot of people showed up because it's been up for a long time in one form or another. So that's that's interesting. But I, I think that uh, what... What grabbed you, though, about haiku, and what sustains you in it? Because, the, you know, we all do things. We all try different things as writers and poets. But what about this genre caught your attention so much that you've been in it now for many, many years? Uh, not as long as some people think. Since about 2015, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, but I've always been... And people find this hard to believe, but kind of an introvert. Um, <laughs> and I like to spend a lot of time alone outdoors. So uh, I just gravitate to nature. And I, I notice little things, you know. So I just, it, that's what appealed to me. Um, just noticing the small things about nature and, and how we connect to nature as human beings. and been very environmentally conscious so that too um drew yeah. me to that um, i've read some environmental slanted haiku that appealed to me and what's uh what's the new journal trash panda i like where she's going with that um so anyway just just nature the environment being alone and then of course um we have people going to the next instrument. <laughs> no of course, of course, being in the RV and being so many different places, I've got to see, I've got to uh, experience new Kigo that you know I didn't have around here in the South. New trees, new birds, and it was just like, so I got the bird app and the plant app and all of that. So. Yeah, well, I, you know, I think. Uh... That that's a that's a big hook for for a lot of people, and I think and people find it hard to believe that I am an introvert, but I, I'm the same way. I pop out in you know, uh, on video, and I pop out when I'm at a meeting, surrounded by people talking about haiku. The rest of the time, pretty much my wife and I hang out in the woods and watch chipmunks, and <laughs> that's what I have outside my window. You know, I just stare outside my office window and. There it is. There's a forest and deer, so and occasionally a bear. But uh, the the fun thing is that's a, that is a big hook for people, and I think the seasonal references that's what Kigo are uh, for the uninitiated. The the that's that's a big thing that the catching the seasons. And by the way, it spills over into Senru, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. Seasonality. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, sure. I, I'm not one of those ones that's like, this is haiku and this is sun roll. And, you know, it's like, whatever. Is it a good poem? Can you relate to it? Uh, sun roof has nature and, you know, it's just where you focus. So, yeah, yeah, it spills over. Yeah, if you, if you write a poem about slipping on the ice, I think you got, got your seasonal reference right there. Yeah. <laughs> but, it's, but it's not about the ice. It's about slipping on the ice anyway that's that's uh that's one of the things that uh uh you know catches people's attention is the seasonality uh of it but uh 
who are people that you consider your your mentors? Who who brought you along? Role models? You've spoken about Michael Dylan Welsh, which I'd put up there for anybody. Uh, but but who specifically? Oh, I hate naming names. <laughs> well, go ahead. They, Do you remember they, that? Do you remember the website um, Tobacco Road that um, Curtis Dunlop did? Oh yeah. I used to read a lot on there, and then that would turn me on to other poets because he would always interview different poets. So, you know, um, Jim Cation, and uh -huh. Alexis Rotella, and uh, Jane Reichel. I got to write some Rengo with her, and that was really cool. Just, oh, gosh, lots of people, lots of people. I write a lot with Brian Rickert now. Um, You've been an inspiration. I, I know I'll miss people, <laughs> but yeah, the whole community, it's just so inspiring. Yeah. And I learn so all the time. Well, I think uh, uh, your experience with HSA and, uh, and the, the, the group that you had there in, in the Southeast, and you've been to HNA, those have the same type of, that's, one of the inspirations, isn't it? Sure, yeah. When I was involved with HSA as a Southeast coordinator, um, we had several big meetings that I planned that uh, one was in Atlanta, one was in Gettysville, Alabama. One was down in Florida near the home of um, Jack Kerouac. Um, so those were really cool. They were fun to plan and everybody seemed to enjoy them. And then my work with the Haiku Foundation, you know, monthly meetings and planning things and getting to know the board that kind of gave me an inside look at some of this stuff. Um, so yeah, I've, I've kind of had my feelers a little bit everywhere. Prune juice was great. I, I'm lucky to have had Ray help me with the technical part of that because I don't swing that way, but it was real fun to put together. I, I love editing, you know, now I'm doing, um, one issue a year of Contemporary High Bone Online, which is my favorite right. job. And I love, you know, reading people's high bone and helping them develop it and become, you know, what they really want it to be without interfering and uh, making it mine, because it's not. Well, that's it. it it's an interesting thing uh, that, uh, uh, that, that people have is that they, uh, uh, the the more you the more people you meet who who write haiku, I think the the better off you are, and I, I you can feel free to disagree, but I think the best way to learn haiku is to read it, read yeah. good haiku. Sure, sure. So, the the more people can can pick it up, that's that's what happened to me. You get stuck in five seven five and all the rest of this stuff right at the beginning, and then all of a sudden you say. Wait a minute, Terry French is getting away with this stuff. Roberta Berry is getting away with something completely different. What the heck? I could do that. I, that's what. That's how I think. You know, all of a sudden, bingo! It dawns on you that there's there's different things. Of course, Marlene Mountain. Did you get involved with Marlene at all, or had she passed? Um, just you know, through reading, yeah. Yeah. yeah it's she, she was a big inspiration to me. But uh, what uh, what parts of haiku, uh, the, the, the genre, do you participate in? I know the answer, but, you know, I know that uh, Haiban, Haiga, Renku, Renge. Tell me, tell me what you what you think about each of those and why they why you're attracted to the areas that you participate in. We started in haiku, branched out to Senru. Then I started doing, which I love collaborating with people. I started doing a lot of haiga and a lot of collaborative haiga. For a while, for a couple of years, I did a bunch of that. I haven't so much lately, um, but recently I did a, a one of the sessions at HSA's last meeting. And I went back and looked all my photographs from our two and a half year trip and then came up and paired some of my writing with those. So they're sort of Haiga-ish. I really like doing that sort of thing. Um, I really like collaborating on Renge, just the experience of 
you know, not planning it, not saying, oh, this is what we're going to write about in the spring game. I don't like to do it that way. I like to just see where, what happens, how it morphs. Uh, Kelly Moyer and I have done some things. We wrote a high bun where we alternated, like I took the first word, she took the second word, I took the third word. That was a blast because we had no idea where it was going to go. And we had to do a little tweaking, you know, but I just, <laughs> collaboration is one of my, uh, one thing I really love. I probably write the most high bun now. Um, and I've kind of slowed down in my writing. I know I, I've heard you talk before, you kind of do that after a while. You know, you slow down a little bit. You don't feel like you have to get your name everywhere. And... I, yeah, pu publication doesn't matter to me. After the first thousand, I, I, I figured I, I proven my case. But uh, my, and everything, you know me, nothing is in print. <laughs> I'm horrible. <laughs> People think I don't like print, but I, I just don't do it. I, I'm a, I'm a geek, and my stuff is in weird places uh in notes <laughs> <laughs> yeah well that's i i use a smartphone to put my thoughts down uh, a lot of people have notebooks i have i have a microphone on a on a smartphone and i don't do anything that isn't uh, electronic but you do what was your last book that you put out um, the, the Color of Bruises, a little chat book I put out through Baby Buddha Press with Stamp Worcester. Which, um, that one's not on Amazon. You can get it through Baby Buddha or you can get it through me. <laughs> yeah, and, you've, um, you've got a lot of, you've got a lot of nice, uh, you take themes by catching. Yeah, it. usually. Um, yeah. I don't have a lot of books, really. I only have, I have three books of um, haiku, haibun, and then I wrote a local history book here. Yeah. I'm working on a children's book now, um, and I would like to put something together about our travels and, and put that together, but not, well, that would I don't be have many out there. That would be good. We'll put a link to your uh, HSA uh, video, too, because that, that gives people a sense for uh, some of the places you and Ray traveled and some of the experiences you had poetically there. But uh, I, I think that you do have themes. You have, uh, 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 you have a lot of uh, familial uh, themes that come up in your, in your work. Yeah, I, I write a lot about uh, the Native American. I think a lot of people probably a lot about growing up and I think as you get older you start to reflect and um, what did that mean to me you know how did that help me become the person that I am or you start to see things that you might have thought were not so good maybe it wasn't so bad you know what did you learn what you glean uh, what was that person about how do you interact with them yeah I don't know if family likes being written about but <laughs> You know, I find it therapeutic, and uh, I think other people can relate. So, well, I, I always appreciated you as an editor too, because you, um, you t you you were willing to take risks, and that's what I enjoy about editors. I, I, I can write to somebody's basic haiku and senru theme. I get that, and we all write plenty of that. But you know, when I when I step out into the into the void, uh, some editors just run away from me. <laughs> yeah. But no, uh, and I like that. Mainly, I like that because that's not how I write. You know, like Johannes Berg, some of the stuff he does, I'm like, wow. But he's always tried to encourage me to go outside of the box. Occasionally, I do, but I'm more of a realist and a literalist and a storyteller. But I really appreciate uh, people who do like the sci-fi or just, you know, just more out there kind of stuff. The, the monopoo, which I'm not real good at. I like reading those. So 
in, I mean, you can enjoy things that you don't necessarily write. You can enjoy other styles that are not like your style. That's exactly. Makes the world interesting. Uh, you were an inspiration to me that when it came to failed haiku, failed haiku actually came out of prune juice and my experience with you as an editor. Oddly enough, uh, I've told you huh. the story, but that's. I didn't know that. Uh, huh? I didn't know that. Oh yeah, no. That I when when you and Ray came out to visit, I'll tell the story to make sure you you don't forget. Uh, I was I, you were thinking about leaving prune juice and giving up the editorship because it was getting to be too much work and stuff and and I said well you're coming out in August uh, I'll, I'll bring it up there and what I would do is I said I'll I'll either do some of the uh, issues for you or I I do the back stuff for you you know work on the website or stuff like that and promote it and I I, I we were sitting outside and I breached, began the conversation and you said, well, I'm out. I already picked a, another editor. You're going to love him. And you did. I did. Uh, Steve Hodge, you know, <laughs> who are friends. Uh, he, and by the way, another Michigan guy. Here's, I, I was happy. And we had a ball together. <laughs> with, with prune juice. But that's, that, that came out of it. Out of that was I had all these crazy ideas I was going to tell you. And uh, I actually thought about Failed Haiku as a weekly. Oh, wow. That would have been so nice. An odd thought that I, I, I erased pretty quickly. But uh, that, so you were the inspiration. Uh, because I said, no, you started Failed Haiku. <laughs> yeah, I said, I got all these ideas now. And the, that, then that just a little bit later, uh, I bumped into Steve Hodge. We got together, and I said, "Hey, I don't want to compete. Uh, I'm going to do this thing, but I don't want to compete with you. I, what I want to try and do is work together." To because Senru only had that one uh, venue in Prune Juice, right. and now there there are two very vibrant venues. I think, at least in Prune Juice and Felt Like Ooh. No, you were the inspiration behind a lot of it, and. Uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, a lot of people owe you. Uh, they, they they say it privately, but uh, they should say it to you publicly. Uh -huh. You uh -huh. did a lot. You did a lot. For I like how I really love how the two journals collaborate and don't compete. It's really cool. Yeah, and like I think with the Merica contest and stuff like that. Yeah. It's cool. Well, that was that was a uh, hodge came to me and said, we got to do something. After he passed away, we said, we got to do something so his poetry isn't lost and stuff. And so we were sitting at Cradle uh, drinking wine, <laughs> as was our... <laughs> and we came, that's how we cooked it up. But you were behind it all. And you picked Steve, who was a brilliant choice, uh, who then picked Brent, <laughs> who, yep. who picked Tia. So... Uh, I, Alexis Rotilla, who who is the founder of of Prune Juice, uh, has turned out her, her 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 child grew up and continues to grow. So sort of sort of cool all the way around. But I, I think that that's uh, that's a kick. But what are the? And it's changed, which is cool. Every editor has kind of tweaked it made it look a little different, has a little bit different idea of what they want to do with it, which is cool. It shouldn't stagnate. It shouldn't stay the same, you know? So I like that too, you know? I don't want to say, oh God, that was, you know, that was my baby, don't touch it, because it wasn't my baby anyway. But babies grow up and change. <laughs> well, I had to laugh. Uh, you know, both Kelly and Brian have had brief moments where people said, well, Mike would have taken that. And I, I sort of chuckle. Uh, because yeah. there were all kinds of people who said, I'll never submit to you again. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. It happens to every editor. And I feel bad when that happens, always. But, you know, so I didn't happen to find something this time that you submitted, and now you're never going to submit again? I told you. Oh. their nose, man, because that'll get around. 
Yeah, well, yeah, and it's also not the all that anybody they can they almost all come back eventually. They calm down. I don't know about you, but I've had dry periods where nobody bought my nonsense either. Yeah, I've had t periods where I wouldn't have taken my stuff either. I mean, <laughs> you know, I look at some of my old stuff and I think, God, oh, I think I was a better writer then. But you just go through different periods in your life. If your life is stressful or this or that or the other, things happen. It's not always constant. So yeah, I get rejected fairly often. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Some of them, though, I will say, and I want to tell other people this, if you have a piece you really believe in, I'm sure you should listen to what editors say and think, well, maybe I should tweak that or whatever. But if you don't think you should and you really love it, stick with it. Because I've had haiku that have been rejected seven times or more and go on to win a contest, you know? So yeah. No, that's... Don't take, it, don't take it personally. Just... Who are we as editors? I mean, who are we? We're self-appointed, if you want the truth. I mean, it's not like a group of wise haiku poets selected me to be an editor or made you the, the editor of Prune Juice. No, nah, we just stood up, waved our hands, said, I'll give a shot at that. And the thing, the secret thing is, what did you get most out of editing? I'm, I'm, it's a loaded question, but what did you get most? Oh, no, you're expecting a specific answer. <laughs> What have I gotten most out of editing? Just to be open-minded, to be a little more open-minded. Um, I don't know, what are you looking for, Mike? <laughs> what do you get most out of editing? Well, what, well there you go, turn it around on me. The, <laughs> the, I, I, the, the thing I get is what we referred to, you, I, it's a con job. I've, I've said this numerous times. It's a con job being an editor. I'm conning good poets into sending me their poems, and I get to read them first. Are you? Oh, well, yeah. There's that. I, that's and by the way, that it leads right into what you said, which is exactly this. It opens me up. I get to say, "Hey, wait a minute." And by the way, uh, both the editors of, of Failed Haiku today are are people who I just love their work. I don't write like Brian. I don't write like Kelly. I mean, I don't. But their work absolutely inspires me. It 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 gets me clicking. Same right. thing with you. I enjoy reading your poems. I enjoy your hymen. And let's talk about your your invisible friend. Who said he's invisible? Okay, pardon me. I <laughs> I, I leapt. Tell them. JT? Yeah. Okay, JT Blankenship. Back before I ever wrote Haiku, I got JT stories, okay? They came to me. Uh, they were told to me, that's what I say. And uh, it was the voice of a little Southern boy. He would tell me stories. He called me Miss Terry. He told me stories. He told me stories whenever he felt like telling me stories, you know, usually when I was sleeping and I'm like, JT, you know, wait later. And I had to write them down and they began as just uh, stories, short prose stories. And I got more and more of them. I got some of them published in um, Dead Mule, you know, the journal Dead Mule. Yeah. I got some of them published just as stories in that. And then I decided when I got into haiku, you know, maybe uh, I, I had a little chat with JT. Hey, what do you think? Your story's my haiku. Maybe we can do something here. Did he grant you publication rights? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, thank he you. Wanted, he wanted them told. So, but the thing is, after I finished putting the book out, when I felt like we both felt like, okay, it's this is it. Okay, we're going to put it out now. Then no more stories. He had other fish to fry, girls to chase, I don't know. He, he, he grew up and he is now the editorial director at uh, the New York Times. So, <laughs> tied up, tied up, JT, you know, tied up guy. <laughs> but that's, that's the, the, the thing you get out of, out of other people 
is you, you get to, to see your approach with JT ha having, a, having a persona that wasn't yours uh, and, and that you turned into a collection of hyben. Have you ever had an editor tell you that you can't, that you shouldn't write things that aren't true? That you should write from truth. And I'm like, this is just rings true to me. You know what I mean? What is what what is true? Do you have to write from ex actual experience? I don't think so. As, but, as an editor, I hope I never did that. Uh, uh, I'm in retirement now, but uh, the uh, uh, as an editor, I hope I, I never did that. I took the opposite approach. Just, just like you, you know. Uh, I remember uh, that the everything I write is true. Okay, yeah. but I may attribute thoughts to other people, uh, you know, in the sense that, but it's all real to me. And uh, if I, in fact, if I told the whole story of my life, I would frighten people too much. I think, I think I frightened my <laughs> wife for ten years; she wouldn't marry me. Finally got her, but uh, the, uh, uh, the the that's part of the experience, and that's that's where the JTs come in, and you see somebody doing that. I remember, you know, that that idea caught my attention. I liked that idea, and that well, and I think too, when you write from someone else's perspective or in someone else's voice, you learn to empathize a little more. I remember, I think we were in California and I saw this woman sitting on the curb making jewelry. And we were sitting like I am now at a table drinking some coffee and I just kept watching her and she had her dog with her. So I finally went over and talked to her and she had some mental illness and she was homeless, but she talked, you know, she's a human being. So we talked for a while. And then afterwards, I started imagining more of what, what was her story. I wonder what her story was. I wonder how she came to be, because it could be any of us. You don't know. And then a story developed from that. But, and that's how a lot of, um, well, uh, The Color of Bruises, all the poems in there are, so, you know, written from someone else's perspective or something I've noticed in, in society trying to bring voice to people that well you wrote the forward so voice to the people that are often not heard yeah exactly uh that's and that's uh, uh roberta beery's whole theme of a lot of her work is exactly the same thing <clears throat> and that's those those kind of things are inspirations to me they get me thinking about stuff by the way i just wrote a hyphen uh Carl Jung said, talked about a circle of friends, people that keep popping up in your life, just on the periphery. And he said, don't ignore that. If, if people keep popping up, engage them. And that's just what you did with the woman. Somebody, a, the women's, a woman sitting on the side of the road got your attention and you engage. And that's because those are the experiences that uh, that mean something to you. And you've been to India too. Yes. Yeah, you and Raymond went to India and Tibet. And uh, oh, we, I wasn't in Tibet. I went to India. I went to Nepal. Oh, Nepal. Pardon me. Ne Nepal. Nepal. Yeah, and that was, those were very enlightening experiences, and I, I loved India. It was overwhelming to the senses for me because it's not what we're used to, you know. It was a lot, especially for an introvert. But wow, I hope very eye-opening, and I got to meet so many cool people. Um, well, I didn't get to meet Kala that trip. I didn't get to meet Koresh Tiwari, who I would love to meet. Um, I met Shloka Shankar, and I got to uh, spend time with Anjali Diodere. Yeah. And uh, just awesome, you know. Just probably one of the highlights of my life. Thus far. Yeah, India is one of my favorite places, and in, in the the that it's also it's also good when you when, when you travel, 
uh, you, you, to be able to go. My, and my wife's been to China and Russia and South Africa and stuff like that. And uh, it's it's the same experience, you know. You we you get to get to be part of some other culture. And I lived in Canada, and I know people laugh in America because they don't get it. Canada is not America. No, I mean parts of Canada are very different from one another. No, they're just like the South, you know. Yeah, Windsor, yeah. Uh, you know, Windsor. <laughs> <laughs> it's it, right across the border from us. We used to watch. I'm sure you did too. Channel Nine, the the. Oh yeah. The, we had Bill we had Kennedy. The, Bill Kennedy at the movies. Yeah, we had <laughs> we had C, the CBC was 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 beamed across the river to us. We saw it all the time. And hockey, of course, mm -hmm. uh, got got dragged into it. But if you if you go there, Toronto is not New York. It's Toronto. And I lived in British Columbia, and I love Vancouver, but Vancouver ain't no San Francisco. It is in L.A. It's completely different. And uh, strangely enough, I mean, that those are the kinds of experiences that I think people people miss. But in well, and you know what I found, like, we've been to Paris, and, you know, you hear people, oh, oh the Parisians, blah, blah, blah. it's like, well, quit going to other countries and expecting them to behave the way you do where you're from you know why do you go there with those expectations stay home if you're gonna if that's how you want people to be you know <laughs> that's i'm sorry that's one of my pet peeves <laughs> yeah no i but uh, ab and i love both i worked for a company in london and uh i love london as crazy as it is and i'm not a big city guy uh, like that uh, London's one of the few places that I really enjoyed being in all the time. And Love to go. Great, great place. And uh, if you know, if you if you when you get into the different cultures, but then you you get on a train and go to Oxford from London, you may as well as be in France. <laughs> it ain't London in Oxford. Right. And it's, it's the same way. It's like Huntsville is not Detroit. Oh, my goodness. When I moved from rural Alabama to Huntsville, which is considered a you know fairly big city in this area, I, I had a little culture shock because it's very different because this is a very metropolitan area because you have people you know coming in for the Army and NASA and big technology. It's very different than living out in the country with soybean farmers and my neighbors were cattle. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but they were—they're both cool in their own way. Yeah, well, that's—I I live in Presque Isle, you know, in the, and it's in the middle of nowhere. Except we have Alpina, and people don't realize it. The Air Force Combat Readiness Center is in Alpina. Hmm. They have a huge area over uh, Lake Huron, which you can't is a no-fly zone because they're busy going supersonic over the lake and we 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 have sometimes we were at a friend's house and they're right on uh on the bay in lake huron and uh there were two uh a-10 warthogs flying wing to wing they came right into the bay they were at like 500 feet wow <laughs> we assume we were assuming that that they knew someone who lived there, and they were putting on a show. Going off, <laughs> but uh, just just to talk to their, to let their friends know they dropped by. But we we get that all the time. So every area is different, and I I think that's one of the attractions of haiku in Senru is that there is no topic that I consider off limits. Is that What's also cool talking about, I know haiku poets all over the world, and I think I could go almost anywhere and probably meet someone that writes haiku. Well, we were in Nepal, we were in Kathmandu, and I forget the gentleman's name. He's, I mean, he's not out there a lot, but uh, somebody else told me about him, and then we managed to hook up, and then there were some other writers in the area, and we met upstairs in this little dinky, I don't know what it even was, but 
a taxi took us there <laughs> and it you know it was so cool yeah it's that's the that's the fun part of uh, uh, of this whole thing and because of the internet uh, uh, you had the same experience at prune juice that I've had I have I have people from India from Romania from Bulgaria from London obviously they have a big contingent there uh, Norway Sweden uh, they all have lo active haiku groups all of them and, and people always think of Japan and America America we're cool and all I get it and I live here but uh, and we have a, we have very active groups but in truth there are more haiku poets writing in English probably in Japan than there are in America because they're all they're all bilingual and there are whole groups that just write now in English in Japan so I worked for two Japanese companies and I learned the hard way <laughs> they, they were quick to tell me you don't you don't own this territory either we own it. We own haiku, whether it's in English or Japanese. But anyway, <laughs> uh, what you're you are an editor and you're an avid reader to this day. Uh, what do you look for in haiku, in haiban, in, in haiga? What are the what are the aspects of each of those that you look at that it, that catch your attention? Uh, I like high buns that are a little raw, you know what I mean? That get, that just put it out there. And tends at times be gut wrenching. I recently read Sean O'Connor's book, you know, it dealt a lot with his father's Alzheimer's. Uh huh. And it was very, just very raw, very real. I like stuff that's, and when I say real, I don't necessarily mean that it has to be a uh, actual experience you had physically. I mean, just something real, something from here. Mm -hmm. um, and I like, you know, that the, I like the link shift between the high bun and the haiku and i i am at fault sometimes just hey that if if the haiku or center or whatever's attached to the high bun can be put into the high bun then it's not linking enough you know i think it, it needs to shift away a little bit but still have that same feeling so that's what i look for and 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 same with the title i look for those three parts and how they work together and with Haiga, also the link and the shift between the image and the poem. And I, and you know, and I have written photo haiku, which I call I'm writing to the photo. But to me, that's not a Haiga because there's not the link shift between the image and the poem. Renge, I don't. Renge to me is just, it's one of my new favorites. I just love to see how people work together and what they come up with and how, you know, you write the first verse and you think you have it in your head where you think it's going and they take it somewhere else. And then you're like, oh, now what am I going to do? And then you take it, you know, but then it ends up all kind of going together. That's fun. That's fun to me. That's like little little puzzles, little things get your brain going, especially if you're going through a, a slump, mm -hmm. which I have a few of those. I like when you're going through a slump, collaborate with somebody. Yeah, collaboration is a nice feature. And I think that uh, for the uninitiated, uh, Ren Gay is, is, a, is a completely American invention by Gary Gay. Uh, and then he and Michael Dillon Welsh and uh, Gene Murtha was involved a little bit uh, at the beginning. He he fell in love with that too, and, and there are others. There, it's it's really a unique perspective to because it, I call it riffing. Right, riffing. Yeah. 
in blues and jazz where the instrument the players all have to play into each other but there uh, no one knows when the drummer is going to begin or end his solo right the first one we did the first one i ever did we were visiting um, curtis dunlop and susan nelson and Ray was there and we were all out on the porch and there was there was cigar smoking, not Susan and I, of course, a little wine drinking, some wind chimes going on, you know, it was dark and we were out on the back porch and somebody said, let's do a renge. Well, and uh, we changed the form a little bit and I don't remember exactly how, but it's in, it's on Tobacco Road. We ended up calling it a Ren Ray <laughs> and we thought it was going to take off. A few of them got published, but it didn't. It never really took off. So, Gary, you're still you're still at run right. It didn't really <laughs> go anywhere, but it was fun. Yeah, it's it's sort of interesting. But what well, you you were a Senru editor. What do you look for in Senru? What what's the what are the elements that you that that are at play for you there? Um, gosh, I like so many different kinds. Like to me, Johnny Baranski was the king of, you know, witticism. Uh, I've told this story before and probably some people listening have heard it, but uh, it was at, during the time of, there were a lot of Viagra commercials. And so I was getting a lot of vi Viagra Senru and I was like, oh my God, I was telling Ray, I don't, I don't want to read another Viagra Senru. So in my editor's notes in the beginning, I put something about, please don't send me any, you know, by Agra Senru. And so Johnny sent me one the next time for a good time, Cialis. <laughs> <laughs> so he didn't write about Viagra, he wrote about Cialis. <laughs> yeah, I remember that one. Yeah. But he... I like the cute things like that, but I also like things that deal with hard topics and, you know, silly and funny is cool, but you can, and I, I did a, um, presentation at Haiku, was it at Haiku Holiday in North Carolina? One year, it was a few years ago, I don't remember. But it was about dark sun, and they can be very dark and deal with social issues oh, yeah. and uh, just really hard stuff. So I like to mix it up, you know, with, with what I present, what I presented in the journal. Yeah, I, I'm pretty proud of the fact that as an editor, I had no rules none whatsoever. I said, you send it to me. I don't care how, I don't care what it's, what it's about. Uh, I don't care. There are no rules. Now I'm still the editor. I can publish whatever I want. You know, I can choose not to publish something if I think it's way out there. But sometimes, um, if, for instance, if you're going to discuss domestic violence, that will be an unpleasant topic. Right. Okay, that's an unpleasant topic. Uh, it's not a topic I would ever forbid. Ever. I mean, I can't... You think there are certain ways of handling stuff like that, or you don't have any rules? There, well, there are certain ways. It's going to be... It's going to involve uh, bad things happening to someone who doesn't deserve it. That's the... That, there's no way to dress that up. Uh, there's no way to dress up an experience, whether you observe somebody or you're a participant. There's no way to dress that up. That's that's violent behavior that none of us. I can't. I don't know anybody in my in my circle would ever engage in. And yet it does happen. And it if you want to tackle that topic, now, Lori Miner tackles a lot of topics. Okay, some of which are very uncomfortable for people. I am very comfortable with Lori Minor. Uh, I, I think it's just a matter of being. If you're writing about yourself, I think you can write whatever you want. If you're writing about someone else, then I think there's a level of a sensitivity maybe there, you know. But that's just me. Yeah. Well, and that's, again, I guess you're an editor. You've been an editor. I've been an editor. I look at things and I say, that works for me, but I'm afraid it's going to just freak out yeah. a thousand other people uh, when they see it and they won't understand it. And a lot of things are done. Just poets do things for effect. 
and I can get that when it works. Right. But I but I but I wanna still wanna see it. I don't have any rules. Never have. Never And I wanted to I wanted to change maybe possibly change the way people look at things or maybe um, change their behavior in some way. I don't and maybe sometimes that happens because they get angry, you know. You might be right. But but I don't want it. There's a fine line. You don't want to go so far that then they miss what you're trying to do. Right. Because I think you want to try to educate people yeah. who, there are a lot of people who need it, you know, who just don't understand certain things. Well, as poets, is, I think part of our job is educate. Right. So. I mean, yeah, that's, that's it. We're, we make that judgment. Yeah, we make the last call. But the other thing I tell people, and I and you were the same way, is don't like it? Don't like that I published that poem? Well, fine. There's 200 pages in the average. Move on to the next one. You'll find something you really enjoy about Ikebana. Yeah. Don't, <laughs> that's don't where you're at. Don't, you know. Don't, but don't, don't worry about it. I mean, you know, it's, you, you can't. But I, I one want thing I don't like, I don't like all the drama. Don't fixate. If you don't like something, find something else you do like. You know, I don't want to get in because to me, drama is so um, contrary to what the haiku spirit is. Yeah. It's openness. It's it, it that's the the whole thing is and you know, I mean Basho in his time, uh, he was tackling topics. I mean, he he made fun of the aristocracy of their his time, you know, just because you're a princess doesn't mean you don't have ticks in your kimono. <laughs> <laughs> and he just because you're a famous haiku poet and you're sleeping in a barn, you didn't drink too much and you're barfing out the window on the flowers. <laughs> he had those topics. Yeah. And, and so I look at it very openly that I'll make that the final decision but you send me anything you you want and try it and if I do try if I do take the risk and you did it with me a couple of times I remember the funniest one was I wrote a very long hyphen about a bar in Milwaukee Wisconsin Frankie Tomasello's that I loved a jazz bar and I remember you said I, I want to publish this I really like it do you think it's too long? You were asking me. <laughs> no. And I, and I said, no, no, that's the whole story. The whole story is Frankie Tomasello's. That it was a great bar in Milwaukee and the hippie thing. We were on the edge of the mafioso. And, and Frankie was one of those. He wasn't in the mafia, but he was certainly pals with uh, the Trilegis who, who ran the show back then and uh, it was just an odd bar where the hippies and the mafioso sat around and drank beers together <laughs> it was <laughs> two can't make that up. yeah two cultures that can't can't be merged in many people's minds was merged all the time and he had a jazz uh, jukebox which was I'm not sure where that came from in terms of either hippies or uh, uh, the mafia but they both work together. So, oh, my neighbors were drug dealers back then. <laughs> so, probably ain't worked for me. But uh, you published that, and uh, I, I still remember. I thank you for that. But well, uh, you know, it's just it's interesting because, like my my uncle was an undercover cop for a while um, in, in Pontiac, Michigan, and he got to know some drug dealers and stuff. And it's like it's. It was really hard to bust some of them because you get to know them, you know? Yeah. You get to know them as people and yeah, they're doing, they're not doing good things, but you have to look, I don't know, sometimes you look where, where did they come from? What, how did they grow up? It doesn't mean that we should condone everything they do, but just yeah. to have a better understanding of humanity, I think. You hit the nail on the head. It's like the, the one of the toughest things to uh, that that Buddha ever said is that the world is perfect at every moment 
It's not perfect the way you want it. It's not perfect the way I want it. It's the it's the way it is, and it's the 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 trick is to accept people. I mean, we go through that now. I mean, we you have to accept people for who they are. Right. I don't I don't care what your deal is. I really don't. If you're a drug dealer and you write good haiku, it's fine with me. Okay, gay, straight, trans, none of that matters to me. It doesn't matter to me. And now I'm not. And I'm not. And if somebody is a petty thief, and they're not stealing from me, and they live in my neighborhood, I'm I'm not condoning their behavior. But I can sit on the porch and have a beer with them. Okay. People don't realize the root of the word prejudice. Prejudge. Prejudge. <laughs> don't do it, and you're never going to win over somebody or change their mind. I often no, think. No, 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 no. Yeah. That's that's the one thing. Oh God, people just get louder and louder trying to win people over, and you know, you you might open someone's mind just to think of something a little differently, or they might do that for you, but that you're not going to change someone's mind by hammering them over the head yep uh, you know I was I'm I'm an old school hippie liberal I plead guilty but you know I I, I don't do anything crazy we had silent protests and they were the most potent things in civil rights when you yeah. just when you just walk down the street and they know why why you're walking and they know what you're up to and they know what you think why are you screaming at them why would you do that by the way you have a right to burn the flag I, and I support that right but it does nothing <laughs> so that's fine but if somebody wanted to write a poem about flag burning would I reject it no not if it was good that's their it works and it's their experience that's what you're sharing. You're not as an editor, and you were that way. I mean, you were an inspiration to me. You taught me a great deal. You and I'll compare you to someone who doesn't, who who isn't you. Charles Trumbull is that way. Ooh, Charlie. Yeah, Charles. That people have different views of Charles. Sometimes my view of him is he taught me one thing. He was always willing to look at anything. He was willing to consider it, not always publish it. <laughs> <laughs> not always like it and I, the other thing is I don't know if you had this experience but I've told people this and I get in trouble every once in a while I publish things I personally wouldn't write and don't like but I know there's an audience for it that will appreciate it will see it and it's well done for that group of people right so I'm not gonna sit down and say well it all has to be pretty it doesn't all have to be pretty. On the other hand, they're very. Um, Sandra Burns is another one, and she has the ability to cross over really easily. She can. Yes, she does. She can. She can cover both sides of the street, Senra and Haiku, and and she doesn't miss. I just. She's one of those. But who who. Just off the top of your head, though, who are some of your favorite poets? Ooh, I don't like doing the favorite poet thing because I always miss. Well, you, you, but, there's probably a hundred, but you can pick a few. Whose books have I recently ordered? I recently ordered uh, Bruce Feingold's new book, um, Sean O'Connor's book. What's this book did I recently get? Uh, Brian Cook. Mm -hmm. I, I tried, like, when we first started our meeting, I said, I can't buy any more books. I gotta, you know, get rid of my subscriptions because there's, I had, like, you know, this Ray needed room for his liquor, you know, and wine. So I had limited space for my books. So a lot of my books are in storage now, but I've started recently buying books again. Because there's so many good poets out there, and I've really been supporting each other. So, uh, those are just some of the books I've bought recently. But 
gone. There's so many poets I really love. Yeah, I'll cool. think of them later. I'll, I'll, I'm going to do a review. You know who you are. <laughs> I could do a review of uh, uh, John Stevenson's latest one. and, and uh, oh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bill Pauly. Who oh, I miss. Yeah, John's still with us, thank God. Uh, John, I think. Yeah, John, I got to hang out with John when we were um, at um, oh, the Hot Springs. Ah. He and Agnes and Ray and I all hung out. It was so cool. I felt like, you know, you know how it is. You feel like yeah. you were the celebrity. Well, he is a celebrity. He's, <laughs> he, he's one of the nicest people, and he, he's, he's also, uh, but the book is, is phenomenal. He is one of the best haiku poets. I didn't say living. I just said period. I haven't yeah, seen yeah. I haven't seen a clinker by him ever. And uh, 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 Randy and Shirley did a bang up job on on his collection, and they also did uh, Bill Pauly. So uh, that to me, uh, those are those are teaching exercises too. You know. Because you see that they try everything, they, they, they experiment. They they have a wide range of topics, and I think that that's the key. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I get that. I get that a lot. You know, uh, in your work, I always enjoyed reading it. So, the um, uh, just one more geeky editors thing but as an editor did you have any process in that you that you went through in your selection process was there anything that you did i don't know the answer to that question because i don't think we've ever discussed it um i usually do there are those that i read and right away i'm like oh yeah oh yeah even if it needs a little tweaking maybe yeah that one's going in and then there are those that even the no's I'll come back to, but then there are ones that's like, that's not, mm, I don't know, that's a no. And then there are the maybes. And then then I end up going back through them all again anyway, but I, I try to at least get an idea. Yes, no, maybe. Yeah. But uh, I don't come by the no's easily. And, and I always, I always, this is why I only do one issue a year because I, I will always, if someone has a question about their piece or why I didn't take it, or I will always try and I shouldn't put this out there, but I will I try to help or offer suggestions or just say why I personally didn't take it. And I might, I might even suggest another journal that I think it would work better, in, yeah. you know? So I, I want to take the time to do that. So I don't want to overextend myself. Yeah. And, and I have a personal bias, and I don't mean to offend anyone. So if anyone's listening who does this, I still love you. If editors don't give responses of any kind to submissions, just say, "Well, it's dead after thirty days." Oh yeah. I don't, I don't like submit. that either. I just can't yeah. feel comfortable with it because it's like nothing. And by the way, you don't have to tell me anything. I never bored you if you didn't take uh, one of my poems. At least say yes or no. <laughs> yeah, at least say yes or no. And sometimes I will tell people, like one of the hard things is to tell people if you're running a send room, eh, I'm sure you had the same issue with prune juice. Steve Hodge and I used to talk about it endlessly. The biggest problem was people send you beautiful poems, absolutely yeah. publishable poems, that are not center they're even close <laughs> the whole poem is about a rose you're dead i mean i can't i can't call that a center i can i can i i'm willing to stretch a bit and, and i also believe i believe there's some crossover but i think yeah. it, it's less than what people think it's the it's the point of the poem it's not whether or not you happen to mention a season so right. You know, I, I just think it's it's sort of, I don't know, it's an interesting thing uh, when, you, when you're looking at other people's work, how it impacts you. 
Because sometimes you see a poem and, and an idea and you think, I had a similar experience. And maybe you oh, don't yeah. don't take the, the poem or, or the or the hyphen that was submitted to you, but you go and take the idea, the experience, and make it into your, pull your own into it. I've had that happen to me. Well, anytime I read, I get, you know, I might read a poem that gets me thinking about something, and it won't be anything like that poem, but but it got that poem inspired this poem, you know? I mean, yeah. read, it, the best way to get out of a writer's slump is to read. Right. And, you know, and uh, the, uh, just, just a hint to, to anyone is that uh, uh, you're doing editors shouldn't ever make themselves into the most important thing about the journal. Most important thing is the poems and that and the poets. It has nothing to do with me. Bale Haiku wasn't successful because of Mike Railing. That's a joke. <laughs> it's successful because people like Terry French. <laughs> they got years. off the ground because of Mike Railing. Yeah, I started it, but only it was an accidental lark. And I remember the first issue was like 60 pages, and I said, well, this is pretty big. Now we've hit close to 300 a couple of times. And you go, wow, I didn't even I have a clue that that would ever happen. And uh, I got to admit, sometimes I don't read every one because it, it takes a long time. But what I also will say is, like you said before, there's something in there for everybody. Yeah. Right? So if you don't like something, keep going. You'll find something. <laughs> By the way, that's but then true. you learn you learn names of whose sure. poems usually resonate with you. Well, it's just true with modern haiku. I don't read every single poem every single time. I don't. Right. I admit it. I'm you know now, Mayfly and Acorn. Yes, they get one hundred percent read by me numerous times. I mean, Mayfly only has fifteen poems. There's some hundred maybe in in Acorn, and. Uh, those two I carry with me and read them over and over and over and over again. Yeah, okay. Um, but Modern Haiku and Frog Pond are different types of journals. They have articles, they have hyphen, they have all, they're much broader in scope. So uh, the, ev everyone has its flavor. And you have, yeah. you have to sort of pick it. Yeah, because there's so many good ones out now. I mean, I would never get any writing done if all I did was read all the wonderful journals and books out there. I think you have some of my old uh, Heron's Nest that I gave yeah. you originally. Yeah, they're, they're in storage. And, yeah, it's okay. It's okay. They'll uh, be in the new house. Somewhere. They were in storage on, in, on my bookshelf for years. They were great, but uh, Heron's Nest, when it moved to the web, and again, that's John Stevenson, who's the managing editor, but he's got a whole crew there. They're great people. Um, and, uh, the, that's a great receptacle of, uh, of, of work and they have a, they have their own flavor too. It's really sort of a unique, each, each journal has to find its own, own niche and its own, own place. But, uh, anyway, that's cool. It's fun. Are you working on anything now? Well, like I said earlier, I'm working on a, a, a children's book um, mm -hmm. with uh, Hima, and I'm going to, don't, if I mispronounce your name, Hima, Hima Priya Chalap, Chalapam, probably mispronounced, but she, she's really cool. We're working together, her cool illustrations, and I'm doing a children's story, yeah. which originally I thought would have haiku, but it just sort of became a children's story, but I might stick one haiku in there. Um, so I'm working on that, and I'm also working on my HSA presentation. Everybody, when I finished, well, not everybody, but a few people said, is this a book? I'm like, uh, should it be? And they, I said, would you buy it? <laughs> and they said, yeah. So I was like, so I'm going to work on that um, at some point when life comes down and uh, try and put that into a, a book format. That's fantastic. When, and, oh, and another cool thing I'm doing with Peggy Bilbro. Uh -huh. um, we, we have a Japanese garden at Montesano State Park up here. And she and I are, um, we got a sponsorship. And we're putting together a haiku path with haiku stones along the path of, around the tea house there. 
So uh, we're gonna have that all together probably by October, working with a local artist who is actually creating the clay stones and stamping them with a haiku. Wow. So excited. That's cool. That's, that's sort of a permanent thing. I, that, and then all of those things help to be, it's like a, you're a missionary for the, for the genre. Missionary, I like that. Yes, I'm a missionary. <laughs> well, and you're, and you're mobile. So you are a true missionary, the Johnny Appleseed of, uh, of ha haiku and senru. <laughs> and one, one last question. What do you want people to take away about you from this interview? Oh, me? Mm -hmm. it, is, it is an interview with you. Hopefully that I'm fair. It's really important to me mm -hmm. to, to be fair and to be open. And uh, I don't know. That's about it, really. Well, I'll just say this. You're a very nice person all the way through, Terry. My, oh, thank you. Every experience I've ever had with you and Ray and Chaka, even, who, I, who I'm secretly in love with, but I won't yeah, steal the no dog secret. from you. I won't steal <laughs> the dog from you. But uh, uh, you, you are a very fair and open and honest person, and it comes through in, all, in everything that you do. So I really appreciate you taking the time. Thanks, Mike. I'm so glad that you came into my life and we're buds. Makes me very happy. We we we're 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 the Michigan crew. We we should have we should get together sometime in in Michigan. Get all the Michigan people together. And oh, wouldn't that be cool? Hang out. Yeah, I'm I'm thinking about how I, how I make that happen, but. Uh, We'll get, I'll get rid of my southern accent if I have one. I don't know. No, it, it's it's wonderful to hear somebody from the Midwest who can say y'all and make it work. <laughs> I appreciate it, Terry, and uh, Mike. I thank you again. Thanks, everyone. Bye, bye, Mike.